today. I really appreciate um, you're taking the time in what I know are very busy schedules these days. Uh, and so I will uh, jump right in here. I'm going to um, just give you a little bit of an idea about what I plan to, to talk about today. I'll uh, start with a brief project introduction. Then I'd like to uh, focus on what kind of considerations uh, we, we, we've been putting into how to structure an integrated uh, approach to resilience and uh, for rural communities in Alberta. And within that, I'd like to weave in a few examples of some of the preliminary results from the study that we're working on. And then uh, I'd like to uh, we'll open it up for a discussion and um, I appreciate your getting uh, any feedback that you may have. So for the project uh, introduction, <clears throat> this project uh, fits within the FRI research theme four, which has a social and economic focus. So it's about uh, considerations such as how do we maintain sustainable rural communities in the face of things like mountain pine beetle. We have research questions around uh, what are the characteristics of resilient communities and uh, what are some practical strategies for enhancing resilience. And how can we make that actionable and operational at local and, and provincial levels? So this, uh, this case study, it's a qualitative case study, which I'll talk about in just a, a moment, began uh, or I got um, involved in mid-2016 and we're working specifically with three communities in Alberta, um, the uh, town of Hinton, uh, Jasper, and we're working with the community of Grand Cache. So I'd like to just quickly outline the steps and some of the methods that we're using in this uh, project. The first step uh, involved synthesizing what, uh, what are the resilience attributes that we, uh, we know of to date? Um, what are the factors that we generally know contribute to resilience in different types of communities? And then from that work, um, we've developed a resilience assessment framework, thinking specifically about how uh, that could be pertinent to um, rural and resource-based communities in Alberta in the context of a mountain pine beetle, but um, I'd like to point out as well that um, we've been thinking about how this framework could also apply to other types of stress events that uh, might be encountered by a rural community up to and including, um, you know, environmental and climate change uh, and uh, perhaps stress events that um, are completely unexpected. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want to take a, we've wanted to take an integrative uh, holistic approach with this and provide some practical value for application by by communities. So we'd like to come out of this with a, a tool that could be uh, applied within communities that want to consider uh, how they might uh, grow and advance resilience in their local context. So the next step um, involved was uh, engaging with a number of different communities in Alberta, talking about uh, the research, finding out what communities' uh, concerns are in regard to the, the pine beetle. Uh, and so and I'd like to, to really um, say a big thank you to the communities that um, are participating and uh, were willing to take some time out of what I know, you know, are uh, is it a busy schedules and the balancing of a lot of uh, difficult priorities. And so I'm really grateful to those communities that are involved in the study. We then uh, conducted 28 semi-structured uh, interviews and um, transcribed that audio uh, recording into uh, Word, uh, Microsoft uh, Word uh, documents, which are stored in encrypted files. And um, just as an example, those interviews uh, were fairly um, in depth. They lasted anywhere from 30 minutes up to a couple of hours. And in, in one case, uh, for a group interview, we went for about uh, four hours or so. And um, the transcription of that work resulted in about uh, between about a thousand and fifteen hundred pages of um, of content 
um, around uh, people's uh, responses. <coughs> Uh, so that's the uh, direct transcription of, of um, what was said. Um, currently, we are nearing completion of the, the data analysis phase, and that has involved a software program known as Envivo, and um, working through all of that data um, and uh, sorting through emerging themes and, and nodes of, of, of concepts of, of particular uh, points and nuances in opinions and perspectives that people brought uh, through us uh, in the research. And just as an example, um, in terms of the context, um, at this point, I've got uh, within that software about uh, approaching about 300 uh, sort of nodes and, and subnodes um, around themes that have um, implications around uh, di different uh, opinion, uh, opinions and perspectives that people um, relate to us in the interviews. So lots of data and, and lots of um, different points to uh, be completed in, in terms of um, sorting out. The, the final phase will be focus groups, which we've been tentatively thinking of uh, for this spring, but obviously nobody's uh, traveling or even getting much out of the house. Um, and so we're planning to um, potentially or hopefully hold that last phase uh, this coming up this fall. And then finally on this slide, I just wanted to quickly point out that this is um, an assessment type of uh, research approach versus proving uh, cause and effect down here on the, the lower right. Um, and so with, with the number of variables involved in a, in a community responding to something like mountain pine beetle, it's really difficult to do a study um, that would try to prove um, a, a specific cause and effect of, for example, if we took Hinton, um, it's, it's not really feasible um, in, in a study to, for example, um, uh, well, it would, it would be in an observational study, but it, it's a different type of study that would look at, for example, uh, stress that um, had impact on Hinton, say from mountain pine beetle, uh, and then if Hinton, for example, enacted a particular set of strategies, uh, were, were those then effective in um, assessing resilience or in improving resilience, sorry. So the focus of this study is on assessment and characterization of resilience. And the benefit of that is that it allows us to look in an exploratory type of context at a lot of uh, different variables that we wouldn't be able to do so otherwise. So for today's, uh, today's presentation, I want to focus on the rationale behind the development of the framework, provide um, a sprinkling of examples of the preliminary results, and then invite your feedback um, uh, on the presentation and what you've seen um, so far. So structuring an integrated uh, resilience approach. I'd like to talk a little bit about why, why is that important? Why did we put emphasis on um, making sure that we've integrated a holistic range of factors into um, assessing resilience. And a, a key reason for that is that uh, there's a, quite a diverse range of opinion um, and conception of what resilience actually is. And that ranges across um, disciplines, academic and, and, and practice. We have, um, vulnerability science, which has certain uh, perceptions of what resilience uh, is. There's climate change adaptation, um, social, ecological, and uh, community urban resilience, etc. And there's different applications of that. So for example, we've got resilience being applied to respond to disasters such as floods or um, storms and earthquakes. We've got um, urban resilience, which has slightly different characteristics in its application to date than uh, community resilience. And there's a lot of different attributes that people look at with, within these. So it's quite easy to find um, a variety of different resilience um, frameworks out there uh, um, on the internet uh, and in academia. And some of them uh, focus on um, attributes such as economic diversity. Others may focus on things like individual human Health. Others might focus on things like contingency funds, <clears throat> excuse me, thresholds, and tipping points. And um, 
if we if we go at this concept of resilience from a from a narrow interpretation that may focus, for example, on any one of these things, um, it has the potential to limit what a community might benefit from in terms of other available perspectives. So what I'm hoping to do with this framework is to um, allow communities to be in the position of uh, considering and, and selecting from um, a holistic range of resilience concepts. And uh, if, if in the end they decide on a focus, for example, that might be include something like economic diversity, they're aware at least of where that's positioned within uh, the, the broader um, concept of resilience. Now I'm going to, uh, I'd like to present a, a little bit of a background on the structure of our framework and how that relates to different uh, conceptual orientations around resilience. This is um, a novel of approach to uh, presenting this type of structure. And, and so in, in a way um, you are the, well, definitely the first um, audience to sort of con consider this type of um, way of presenting resilience orientation. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, your feedback uh, about whether this was effective or not after the, the presentation. So I've got um, a horizontal axis here on this slide in which I positioned um, stability orientations towards resilience on, on the left. Um, and that's been up to date, uh, the most uh, common um, viewpoint towards resilience, uh, both in um, in practice and to, to an extent in the academic literature. So this is a view of resilience, um, which characterizes a community response as, as resisting a disturbance and, and bouncing back after a stress to a pretty much where the community uh, was at be before. <clears throat> and uh, on the other side of this continuum, I have placed um, change. And this would be a perspective on resilience from which we may encounter a disturbance or stress that may be of a magnitude um, from which it's not possible um, any longer to remain stable and bounce back to just where a community had been um, functioning before a, a disturbance like mountain pine beetle. And in my interviews, uh, I found uh, unsurprisingly that um, a number of people um, in in the foothills uh, communities uh, view resilience from a stability uh, standpoint in terms of um, you know we'll focus on being able to bounce back to the way we were before. But also I encountered um, quite a range of uh, perspectives on what resilience might look like in a in a rural uh, community in the foothills that included. Uh, possibilities of, of change and, and transformation. Now I placed a vertical axis um, in this, what um, we call a, a topography of, of con, uh, conceptual orientations. And, and on the top, uh, I've placed um, what I'm referring to as predictive um, type analytical responses to um, a shock or disturbance. So this would, what we, what would be what we would commonly uh, refer to as, say, a, um, a risk hazard analysis type of approach, where, say, in, in the context of mountain pine beetle, um, we are uh, looking at um, factors that help us to predict when, where, and, and how, how bad the impact uh, might be from mountain pine beetle. And then on the bottom, we've got surprise, which comes from complexity, science, and uh, ecological resilience. So I placed a, a traditional, and this has been the most common application of resilience in across most fields to date, uh, in terms of, again, um, assessing risk and predicting uh, potential hazards and responding um, from that information. On the bottom, ecological, social ecological resilience, which has a complexity and, and orientation towards surprise. And Urban and community resilience uh, to date has been located in this uh, upper uh, left corner with a, a, a somewhat of a, a bias or orientation towards, again, prediction um, and stability orientations. 
and uh, in the past uh, few years, it's it's been on a bit of a trajectory uh, towards incorporating a greater level of um, of uh, response to surprise and uh, the possibility of, of transformation type pathways. So, in this uh, framework that uh, we've been developing, I'm targeting an, an integrative response that would allow communities to consider um, responses and uh, analytical orientations from from all of these uh, different perspectives. <clears throat> Now I'd like to show you a couple of additional uh, continuums of resilience uh, perspectives. Some orientations toward uh, resilience uh, focus on the local scale and local scale actions. So for example, um, actually I'll, I'll elaborate on that a little bit more uh, in a moment. Um, and other orientations on the other end of this um, continuum focus on cross-scale interactions. So when we were engaging with communities in uh, Alberta about what uh, concerns were currently around mountain pine beetle. We noticed that uh, in some communities, there was a significant level of, of interest and concern for uh, the local uh, community scale, uh, being able to have uh, influence and interactions um, a, a, from the, the local scale across to broader regional, provincial and, and federal scales of, of governance and influence. On the other hand, some uh, orientations of resilience uh, or strategic um, action would focus on, on um, strategies that would be within the community itself at the community scale, for example, um, for local uh, infrastructure, protection, uh, safety, um, community safety, uh, and even uh, down to a finer scale at individual human health. On the vertical axis, I've got uh, human agency. So this would be uh, orientations that focus on how individual people and communities can exert influence um, through specific actors, organizations, um, in influencing what's happening around um, an issue like a mountain pine beetle. And then on the bottom, we've got structure. So how do uh, rules uh, and policies impact uh, communities' uh, vulnerability and response to something like pine beetle. So up at the top here, within our framework, we've incorporated elements of uh, leadership, advocacy, and again, these are just um, some examples that I'm I'm uh, bringing up here within a, a framework that has a, quite a, a large number of different attributes. At the bottom, uh, we've been looking at how different policies, uh, norms, uh, collective learning and uh, diversity of, of response are impacting community resilience to a uh, mountain pine beetle. And on the left, uh, we've been uh, hearing from communities about the importance of um, uh, local infrastructure. <clears throat> For example, hazard trees um, in, that have been killed by the beetle uh, impacted by um, in, in the short term um, human health. And on the right, we've got um, collaborative governance and collective action from the local scale uh, across to other jurisdictions and uh, upscale to the province and the, the federal levels. And just one one more of these um, to, to show you. I'll go through this one a little bit um, more uh, quickly. We've got, um, I'm sure a number of you have heard of the capital's approach to uh, community resilience and sustainability. So different um, assets, uh, natural capital, forest resources, uh, financial human capital that contribute to uh, capacity of a community to adapt. And on the other end of the spectrum, we've got uh, the activation of uh, latent assets um, in, in the sense of at, at a certain point, um, a community becomes activated um, to respond to a particular um, crisis or stress. And on the vertical, we've got place-based attributes, which I'll elaborate uh, in a moment, and normative critical social science perspectives on resilience. So on the top, place-based would refer to um, things uh, that we can benefit in, from in terms of local knowledge, cultural, social memory. One of the, um, one, an interesting um, 
area of feedback that I re received in um, a number of different interviews uh, was that different communities in the foothills uh, vary in their experience, and I'm referring to social memory here, in their lived experience of um, cycles of uh, economic um, ups and, and downs. Uh, so we've got some communities that have been quite stable um, in the past few decades and don't have a lot of um, in uh, social memory around how they've responded to, uh, say, a, an economic downturn in the past and other communities that have experienced significant ups and downs in the past and have some uh, memory about how um, they've um, responded and uh, dealt with those. Uh, under normative, we've got uh, topics around how to uh, differences in, in equity, vulnerability of uh, different social groups and uh, power, impact, resilience. Um, in this perspective, for example, um, one might ask questions around, well, who's going to be uh, benefit uh, from uh, community resilience and who might make decisions around, um, you know, what sectors should be resilient and um, what resilience uh, should be should be in a community. Uh, resources, networks, and people in terms of uh, contributing to latent assets. Uh, we'll be looking at some specifics uh, on that in a moment. And activation, so how aware a community is to an issue like mountain pine beetle um, and level of, of concern, contribute to uh, activation, having um, leaders, uh, actors in the community that uh, are exerting leadership and uh, action are important to how a community um, responds and is resilient. So in terms of a structure um, for how a community might do a self-assessment and consider uh, different types of actions, um, again, I'm hoping for, um, and, and this, this, um, these frameworks again are in development stage, but hoping to give communities a bit of a framework to pin different concepts on so to be able to think in a structured way around uh, factors that um, they could uh, take action on to uh, build resilience. So we've got a community context with um, varying levels of, of well-being and within that um, it has different levels of exposure to uh, mountain pine beetle or other types of uh, stress from climate change. Uh, there are factors that contribute to community stability. Again, I'll look at some specific examples of those uh, in a moment. And um, there are elements that contribute to a community's adaptive capacity. A community can be uh, activated in terms of um, initiating a response to an issue uh, like mountain pine beetle. However, I wanted to be explicit in this framework, which is um, a little bit novel in comparison to what some of the other frameworks uh, are focusing on in that a stress like a mountain pine beetle could be uh, either anticipated which uh, would result in some risk assessment and perhaps some measures you know for early mit mitigation of an impact um, but a, um, a stress event could also be a completely um, completely unanticipated and surprised in which case it would a response would not be mediated by a risk assessment. That surprise event would impact directly on that community and uh, its well-being. Uh, and impacts from that surprise event would eventually uh, result in some uh, activation uh, and response. <clears throat> so again, something like the, although this is not a, um, a human health-focused framework, a surprise event um, could be something like um, uh, a coronavirus or something uh, that we um, didn't expect that comes uh, directly out of left field. So when a community uh, gets hit by um, an event or an impact, they have the opportunity to uh, activate those uh, elements of adaptive capacity such as uh, resources, finances, contingency funds, uh, etc. And engage uh, in a policy um, decision-making context in terms of what, what types of actions uh, could be taken in the short, medium, and long term. In a mountain pine beetle context, uh, again, we found uh, throughout the interviews that there are concerns, uh, different types of concerns around impacts which um, are shorter term in terms of 
Um, for example, uh, visual impacts occur uh, quite quickly. Um, hazardous trees, um, snags begin to show up uh, quite quickly, but um, other impacts or more medium and, and long-term, for example, uh, impacts to uh, timber supply uh, would be an example of a, of a longer-term uh, impact. And decisions can be filtered uh, in terms of whether uh, they can be taken at the local scale across to uh, re regional, provincial and federal scales uh, and whether they might be focused on um, <clears throat> building a more general resilience um, to events that might be um, a surprise in the future and may not be specific to mountain pine beetle. Uh, and then a community might decide to take actions that would be focused on uh, resisting a change. So it, it, for example, in, in mountain pine beetle, um, actions around, for example, um, mitigating, stopping uh, the mountain pine beetle would be uh, characterized uh, within here. Other measures might be more adaptive in the sense of uh, adapting um, industry and, and other um, types of, of factors to be able to respond uh, to uh, the disturbance. Uh, and in some cases, when a, when the magnitude of a disturbance is uh, too great to remain uh, in this uh, existing uh, context, transformation might be the best option. So some examples of what we've been looking at. Uh, exposure um, in, in um, the context of mountain pine beetle, we've looked at factors uh, around obviously what levels of exposure to different communities in the foothills have um, in terms of uh, forest sector economy and employment. And um, that's quite variable across communities. In, in some cases, we've got um, the forest sector as a it, 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 um, significantly high component of the municipal tax base and local um, employment. In other cases, uh, tourism plays a, a larger factor. Factors like uh, corporate philanthropy from uh, industry are also quite important to um, communities in terms of support to uh, recreational sports leagues, um, et cetera, et cetera. There, um, we're noticing a high level of uh, interdependence in the tourist industry, for example, um, between uh, communities like uh, Hinton and Jasper. And there's some exposure. Uh, we received some uh, concern, for example, in small businesses in the tour tourism industry of, of being significantly exposed to something like, um, say, a short-term reduction in, in uh, local uh, tourism. We looked at, um, we received a, a lot of feedback with regard to concern about safety and infrastructure, uh, local identity and lifestyle and how that might be affected by the beetle and um, vulnerable, vulnerable groups. <clears throat> We um, had some feedback, for example, um, that in uh, the forest sector employment, employment specifically in, in forest sectors and uh, forest manufacturing is, a, um, is valued among um, some First Nations indi um, individuals as um, a, a valued sector for employment compared to uh, other employment alternatives. For some specific, uh, for specific reasons, so um, uh, this framework can identify uh, groups that may be uh, particularly vulnerable to perhaps um, a loss in employment from uh, longer term from something like uh, mountain pine beetle. Stability. Uh, we've looked at elements uh, like biophysical, which I'm no doubt many of you are are uh, more versed on than I am in terms of. Um, how they impact the vulnerability of a community to mountain pine beetle, but obviously species diversity and um, amount of uh, pine component in the timber supply, age class, elevation that affect uh, vulnerability of pine in different areas of the landscape. Economic diversity, so how diverse is the economy and, and what's the level of reliance on um, supply of, of wood that might be affected uh, by pine beetle uh, community cohesion, we looked at um, uh, thresholds, how close are different aspects of communities to potential uh, tipping points in terms of, for example, municipal budgets. And uh, we found that in many cases for rural Alberta uh, communities, um, 
budgets are are not um, far from uh, tipping points. For example, in the case that uh, there was a loss in tax revenue, and uh, there are not a lot of uh, contingency funds to draw on in the case of, of a loss of uh, tax revenue or, or local em employment. Uh, cu cumulative stressors came out as um, very important in the sense that um, factors um, like uh, lumber tariffs, um, lumber prices, global um, markets in combination with stress from an event like mountain pine beetle can be cumulative in the sense of uh, pushing um, industry towards uh, different tiffing points. And we looked at uh, latitude for response. So this would be the, the timing of impacts. We've identified uh, that some are short or medium versus uh, longer term. And the time window that that might give a community to, to think about um, different strategies for response. So in some cases there's uh, more time and some in some cases there's uh, less time and uh, actions need to be uh, planned and considered in, in the short term. And I'm getting near the, the end here and so we'll be able to open up for discussion fairly shortly. Latent adaptive assets. So we've asked people about uh, everything from collaborative spirit. and We've uh, received really strong response in terms of um, um, collaboration, um, spirit of collaboration within rural communities, uh, resourcefulness, which I don't have up here. Um, rural uh, community communities in Alberta tend to uh, have lots of people that are very re resourceful and adaptive to change. So these are strong points in terms of resilience. Um, there's very uh, variation in, in um, nuances in entrepreneurialism, uh, which we'll um, I'll leave for uh, our later more formal reports uh, coming up this spring. Um, resources that communities can draw on in, in the case of a mountain pine needle, financial, human uh, resources. One thing that uh, we heard fairly commonly in our interviews was that there's a perception that volunteerism is um, declining to some extent in rural communities. So, um, and volunteerism is uh, felt to be an important uh, characteristic that can contribute to a community uh, recovering from uh, different types of events. Conditions for collective action and collaboration. So knowing that uh, some communities are um, concerned about how they can be proactive and uh, respond across uh, levels of governance we looked in some level of detail at um, uh, con conditions that can uh, contribute or detract from uh, the ability to collaborate um, and act collectively in response to an issue. So things like compatible and con conflicting interests. Um, there's uh, lots of examples of uh, compatible interests around um, you know, regional economy uh, and employment. Interdependence between communities a mutual understanding of um, interests and needs across different jurisdictions and even understanding of uh, what the drivers and dynamics of uh, mountain pine beetle um, are and so one example of um, an indication that's been coming out of the um, in vivo work is um, the potential for um, for disconnects and uh, nuances and different understandings uh, around what the interests of um, of neighbors um, actually are between jurisdictions, for example, in the foothills uh, and Jasper Park, and even nuances and um, differences in understanding uh, around what the dynamics and uh, drivers of, of mountain pine beetle um, have been. And so through some of um, that information that's coming out, we're hoping just to uh, be able to pro provide some some feedback in terms of um, uh some attributes that um might be where there might be opportunities uh to um provide conditions for um collaboration and and communication uh, around addressing issues like uh, pine beetle in the future and and other things that may come out of of climate change and cross uh jurisdictional uh boundaries uh in the future so uh, some things are coming out of that um <clears throat> Institutional adaptive capacity. 
um, the knowledge for um, around mountain pine beetle mitigation was um, or responses we received were generally high or around uh, sufficient knowledge. Uh, but there's um, concern around at the community level having enough uh, knowledge about uh, future economic scenarios and, and uncertainty about what's going to be happening. And so there's um, an, an interest in 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 collaborating and um, looking at uh, different uh, scenarios in terms of you know how how bad is a bad in terms of uh, impacts to the forest industry and what that might look like in the future. Uh, Flexibility in policy and decision-making mechanisms and um, single, double, and triple loop learning in the sense of uh, we saw significant um, learning and, and adjustment happening in terms of um, adapting adaptive management uh, adjustments to existing uh, processes and, and policies to be able to respond to something like the pine beetle. Um, and we saw a little bit less, a fewer examples uh, around triple loop learning in terms of um, a uh, space uh, for um, considering um, more deeper underlying uh, sort of uh, interests and uh, paradigms uh, in, a, in approach. I'm going to uh, move on quickly to the next one. We looked at uh, activation. So um, again, high level of mountain pine beetle awareness and concern in some um, foothills communities, um, whereas in, in other ones uh, where pine beetle um, hadn't arrived yet, that level of awareness and concern uh, might be uh, uh, different. Uh, we saw significant leadership across um, uh, communities in terms of responding. Uh, and uh, some definite examples of, of conscious um, uh, planning in terms of um, primarily during the early stages of pine beetle, we were seeing examples around uh, public safety and um, protection of, of infrastructure. And um, that just brings us back to uh, the framework that we've looked at. Again, um, hoping to uh, this will probably be revised somewhat in the coming uh, months, but a framework from which a community can pin uh, different types of uh, concepts uh, and orient themselves within uh, a structure of, of community, an organized structure of uh, community resilience.